It's Tuesday's PFTOT, the extra show that we do to jam in all the things we couldn't get to during our allotted time on NBCSN and NBC Sports Radio. And Chris, I want to start with some comments from Bruce Irvin, the former first round pick of the Seattle Seahawks who won a Super Bowl there, comparing his new team's defensive line to the Seattle Seahawks defensive line of that Super Bowl year, primarily by virtue of the depth, the ability to have that eight-man rotation and yeah. bring guys in and out. Now, look, that may be a stretch because that Seattle Seahawks defense was special at all levels. Are you seeing anything from that Carolina front four when you factor in the ability to rotate in backups that makes you think this could be a special group? Well, I'm, I'm glad he qualified depth because that's, that is the thing that jumps out to me more than anything. I mean, I think that's what he's speaking to. You know, the talent level, of course, with this Carolina Panthers D-line, it's good, but I'm certainly not going to put it into the class, right, of that Seattle Seahawks team where, you know, yeah, some of the backups, number five, six, seven, and eight on the Seattle defensive line, you know, in that 2013 season would have been starters for, for most teams in football. Ball. That's how special that was. But when you break it down, Mike, and you get into it, okay, and you talk about Brian Burns, the pass rusher with Mario Addison, okay, and they got guys that could come off the bench there and supplant them. But to me is the waves of big people in the middle of their defense. That's amazing. You know, when you get into Vernon Butler, who was a first-round pick, and the Woodrow Hamilton, who plays, and Kyle Love, and, oh, Gerald McCoy, and, oh, Dante, Dante Poe. And then you go, oh, gosh, I forgot. Kawan Shorts there. And then you go Destiny Vallejo, who's been helping the Eagles the last two years. And you just go, wow, okay, yes. So it might not be the sexiest names, the most household names, you know, big time statistical people, but it's a lot of big people that jump out to me and a lot of quality players, not necessarily maybe Seattle star players. All the more reason to think the Panthers could be a sneaky good team this year. Yeah. Hinging on whether and to what extent quarterback Cam Newton can stay healthy and before he stays healthy he has to fully get healthy in the aftermath of that offseason shoulder surgery teddy bridgewater has had a hard time getting healthy in the aftermath of the torn acl he suffered three years ago in a practice just a few days before the start of the regular season he decided to stay with the saints this year after his one-year contract expired the saints had given up a third round pick to get him from the jets after he signed a contract in new york and Bridgewater explains that he stayed in New Orleans because he wants to grow as a player. He didn't have a lot of options, Chris. The Dolphins wanted him, and if he'd have signed in Miami, you know what would have happened. Josh Rosen shows up the, uh, the second day of the draft, so at least Teddy Bridgewater has an opportunity to maybe get to the point where he has a chance to replace Drew Brees whenever Brees retires, and it could be a combination of Bridgewater and Taysom Hill in New Orleans with Taysom Hill still coming out from time to time and Teddy Bridgewater running the offense. And 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 who knows? Look, I don't know that his knee's ever going to be what it was before it was gru uh, gruesomely torn right. in that incident nearly three years ago. But I, I kind of like the idea that Bridgewater's just kind of out there operating under the radar screen with the possibility right. that someday – we're going to be reminded that, you know, he was on track to being a decent quarterback. Yeah, no no question. I mean, I honestly think it was a smart move by Teddy Bridgewater. Unless there was just some, you know, can't lose type of situation out there where, oh, you're going to be the starter and you're the guy and you don't have to worry about us drafting or, you know, trading for a Josh Rosen. Uh, then this was the right move. And that situation did not exist. So I think he made the right decision. One, you know, hey, you're in a great spot. You're learning from a great coach and you're improving your game. Uh, you're getting back to where you might, you know, might have been before the knee injury or, see, or at least getting as close as you possibly can get in another situation like this where you're not going to be expected to play and every the burden of that's going to be on you right away. And the biggest thing to me, Mike, is, you know, hey, man, if Drew Brees, let's just say, gets a high ankle sprain or hurts his shoulder and you're the backup quarterback of a team, man, this is the team to be a good backup quarterback for. We've seen, you know, back Josh McCown or Luke McCown, when he used to come in for Drew Brees, he used to put up phenomenal numbers. And because of the offense and the team they have around him, if Bridgewater got two or three games to show what he's got and showed some success and, oh, wow, he can still play at a high level – it's only going to set him up for the future to get everything he wants and get that, you know, the market clamoring for him again to be a starting quarterback somewhere. Say it's got a playoff win in January over the Philadelphia Eagles, and that's when we last saw Fletcher Cox on a football field. The Eagles defensive lineman has not participated in anything since then. He had a foot injury, had surgery. He recently 
told WAPT in Jackson, Mississippi, that he anticipates being ready for training camp. He said, everything is going good. I'm happy about that. Taking it day by day. The goal is to be ready for camp. Doctors got a schedule. I'm following what they're doing. Everything is going good so far. The Eagles need this guy. They're a different defense when he's not on the field. And, yes, they've added Malik Jackson and they kept Timmy Jernigan, but they need Fletcher Cox to be healthy or it's going to be a lot harder for the for the Eagles to stop people, Chris. Well, he's a phenomenal football player. I mean, it, Mike, I, you know, we talk about him a lot, and I know maybe a lot of it's even off air, but this is a guy that is – in the conversation for one of the five best defensive players in football. I mean, he's in the conversation for the best defense alignment in football, not named Aaron Donald. And I'll say this, I don't think the gap between him and Aaron Donald is as big as maybe people might perceive it to be because some of what Fletcher Cox does does not go on the stat sheet when he just, you know, makes a mosh pit in the middle of the defensive line and holds a double team or a triple team and just stands there and doesn't get moved. That doesn't go on the stat sheet. Those are things that he's better at than Aaron Donald at, but nobody's ever going to always be able to you know kind of quantify it with the stats and everything like that but I'm with you Mike it's a big deal this is the this is the big stud on that Eagles defense and they need him you know to be playing certainly because the style of play and what they ask him to do is special and it certainly helps their defense yeah that's absolutely true and uh, well, I've got high hopes for the Eagles this year Me too. Um, but uh, that 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 hinges on the presumption that Fletcher Cox is going to be good to go when the regular season begins and he's hopeful that he'll be ready for training camp all right there's, there's been plenty of talk over the past couple of weeks about the NFL's intent to make pass interference subject to replay review we spent some time last week talking about a play from the Chargers Chiefs week 15 game that Al Riveron, the NFL senior VP of officiating, has disclosed would have resulted in a ruling on the field of defensive pass interference becoming offsetting fouls because replay review would have shown that Mike Williams, the Chargers receiver, pushed off to gain separation on a play that ultimately didn't result in a reception, so it would have been a do-over. And there may be more plays like that where the end result is they'll just say offsetting fouls and we'll do it all again. But there's another play that Rich Eisen mentioned in his Monday guest appearance at Football Morning in America that got my attention, Chris. The Super Bowl 53 play right before the interception that sealed the game when Jared Goff went right back to the Brandon Cooks well and right. got picked off by Stephon Gilmore. One play before that, there was early contact from Gilmore on Cooks as he was trying to catch what would have been a touchdown pass. And Al Riveron believes that that's a play that would have been overturned by replay review. And I'm struggling with this. And we've, we've posted a link to the video. You can find it very easily on Google otherwise. The, the standard is clear and obvious evidence of an error and including within that clear and obvious evidence that the player was significantly hindered by that early contact. And, Chris, I'm struggling to see clear and obvious evidence that there yeah. is a significant hindrance of Brandon Cooks because even though Stephon Gilmore grabbed his arm, he Cooks rips his arm up and has both hands in position to catch the pass and only drops it because Deron Harmon was closing in with a big hit. The, the, the contact from Gilmore, it's, here's the thing. Yeah. You could have an argument that it did affect him. Oh, look, it affected him. Look, his arm moved more slowly or whatever. You can't say it's clear and obvious that – the contact from Gilmore significantly hindered Brandon Cooks. And that takes what happened in the Rams-Saints game and throws it into an entirely new environment of potential calls that are going to be overturned that I don't think the NFL ever intended. And it's going to be a mess if that kind of thing gets reviewed and reversed in the 2019 season. Yeah, Mike. I mean, th this is the problem. This is, what we're, this is the can of worms we're opening up. I mean, uh, again, this is why... Uh, if you remember not long after that game and, and the Rams Saints and all that, you know, I know I clamored. I think Big Cat was even on the show with me one day where I just said, don't change any of the rules. Everything is fine. It was a once in a 50 year mistake. It stunk. They messed up. That's all there is to it. Now, here we go. And I just I, I, I am hoping for the best this year. But I, I see it as pass interference, but I can understand how others don't. And I think this is the same argument we're going to get into a little bit. It's still going in to human error and how the human sees it as pass interference or not pass interference or clear and obvious or not clear and obvious. And uh, that's where it's really dicey here. And uh, I, I just, uh, I got to see how this plays out. I, I'm, I'm not necessarily in favor of any of this at this point. And you know what? And here's the thing. I got two points. Yeah. First, 
All I wanted was a fail-safe. All I wanted was break glass in the event of emergency. I wanted to have a mechanism in place to change that horribly bad outcome. Gotcha. I don't want a mechanism in place that's going to second-guess every pass interference call and non-call. Secondly, what this is going to become is this vague crapshoot, roll of the dice, that fans who don't understand all the nuances are going to think, oh, hey, maybe there's a chance they're going to press the button. Maybe there's a chance they're going to overturn this. I don't know what I'm seeing. I don't know what I'm looking at. But you know what? Sometimes they have replay review of these plays and they throw a pass interference flag. Sometimes they pick it up. Sometimes they call offsetting fouls. I'm just going to sit back and hope for the best without really appreciating that this was put in place, ideally, to eliminate egregious errors. Right. And here's the problem. Mm -hmm. If Al Riveron thinks that what happened in the Chiefs-Chargers game is in the same category as Rams Saints, if he thinks what happened in Super Bowl 53 is in the same category as Rams Saints, this is going to be a mess. And this is where I'm trying to choose my words carefully. Yeah. This is where the NFL needs to go to Al Riveron and say, Al, that's not the way it is. And if you're not going to be able to implement this rule as we see fit, we need to find somebody else who will. Period. And yeah. I know that may sound harsh. I'm not saying fire Al Riveron. I'm saying maybe find somebody else who is going to be in position to handle those calls because he's going to micromanage something that is supposed to be there only in the event that the house is on fire. Rams Saints, the house was on fire. These yeah. other plays, the house ain't on fire, Chris. Right. I, I, Mike, I'm, I'm with you. And, you know, you're only opening it up for all the fixes in, the conspiracies. Oh, the NFL wants this team in the Super Bowl and not that team. I mean, to me, that's where this whole thing seems to be going, let alone, I again, we've talked about this a million times over the last month. I'm worried about the game being bogged down by this and have to see the execution of it. But, Mike, I mean, you made all the good points. I don't think I have anything else to say. Say. One last topic for today, and people will say, well, this isn't about pro football. Well, it is because the NFL is part and parcel of the problem here with that artificial barrier that has been erected to keep college football players in college for three years after they graduate from high school. California is working on a bill that would allow student athletes to gain revenue from their names, images, and likenesses. No pay from the schools, no money off of the NCAA's ledger. This is players using their names, images, and likenesses for their benefit, and the NCAA is squeezing California. A letter from NCAA President Mark Emmert, written, written in a very diplomatic way, but basically threatens California. If you do this, your schools aren't going to be eligible for national championships. Chris, I think this is bogus. It's one thing to find a way to not pay players. It's another thing to continue to refuse them the opportunity to make the same kind of money that Olympic athletes can now make while still retaining amateur status. It's wrong, it's immoral, it's greedy, and it's overdue for this change to happen. Yeah, I mean, 100%. I mean, the NCAA, I mean, they're not one to be able to talk about more moral integrity or doing any of that anyways. I mean, all the people who got their hands out as far as, you know, all, you know, cash for bowl games and all of that stuff. I mean, it's just as a, anybody I talk to, it's a dirty, weird business as how it all goes down between the NCAA and the bowl affiliations and everything like that. A lot of money exchanging hands under the tables. It's okay when they're doing it, but damn, Deion Sanders, you can't take Des Bryant out for lunch. That's a crazy, you broke a raw. Whoa, that's great. You know that, I mean, that's where we're going to. But yet, you know, random committee guy for the Fiesta Bowl, he can go under and put his hand underneath the table and take a few thousand dollars for himself because he brought a guy to cocktail hour and they had a good conversation. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, it doesn't seem right. Seems hypocritical. Uh, there certainly needs to be more that goes to the players. I know there's a lot of good things and certainly, yes, you have scholarships and all that, but you're right. I mean, this is a can't lose billion dollar industry of college football, jersey sales, likenesses, apparels, all of those things. And a uh, very small fraction goes to the players. And a lot of which what everybody thinks is like, oh, they're division one scholarship athletes. You know, they're sitting in back in their dorm room. That's, you know, better than any other dorm room in football. And, you know, they got their own lunch and cafeteria no it's not like that it's not and a lot of the guys and, and here, yeah go ahead i was just saying a lot of guys line. have here's a hard a time line. having extra meals during the day yeah they, they they get value for what they do 
but it's not fair value yes, for what right. they bring to the table. Right. And this is a way to allow the players to get some semblance of fair value for what they do. Now, you know, a lot of the things you suggested, we're not making any specific accusations against any specific people about wrongdoing committed by anyone affiliated with any NCAA institution. I'm just doing that, Chris, so well you said. don't get sued. Thank you. But, but, and you, I assume you agree with everything I just I said. Disagreed. We're not making any specific I accusations I here. Agree. There we go. I'm just, yes. just trying to be clear, counselor. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the, the point is this. There's an imbalance, a gross imbalance. And and I think the people who just want to enjoy their college sports without being burdened by the ethical dilemma of asking yourself, is it right to sit there and enjoy that college football game when you know deep down that these kids are getting screwed? And if in California, they're trying to be leaders when it comes to finding a way to allow the imbalance to be rectified, and the NCAA is trying to squat on their heads over it, that that's amazing to me. That there's got to be a way. There's got to be a way to uh, to let these kids get something more for what they do. And if you can do it without taking any of the money away that's coming through the coffers anyway, then then why should it be a problem? So yeah, anyway, right. that, that's all we need to say about it. Yep. It's wrong. It needs a change. And I don't know that it ever will. That's it for today's PFTOT. A new edition of Chris Sims Unbuttoned is coming up later today. Is uh, Phil... Making yep. appearance the today? big the big effort will be on there today. I don't know. We've changed around the time of the podcast, so I can't guarantee it right now. So I'm not a hundred percent sure. I'm only like eighty percent sure. The the big effort is not real flexible when it comes to changing his times. No, you know he's got his strict schedule, a strict schedule of things, <laughs> and who knows what he's got to do. <laughs> All right, well we'll check that out later today. We'll see everybody tomorrow. Three more days until we begin our hiatus. Once, once Chris gets his four weeks off, he may never come back. So who knows? This may be his last three days ever. Either <laughs> way, wait. we'll be back on Wednesday. Everybody have a great day. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.